I'm actually a postdoc working in Dr. Gary Hans' lab in UT Southwestern. So today I'm going to share with you some of our work uh, about how we use single cell technology, perturbation assays to study the function of enhancers. To, to start from some a little bit background about enhancers. So enhancers uh, first reported in 1980s are actually some cis regulatory elements on our genome, which are believed to provide the cell type specific transcriptional regulation to the genes. So in the past decade, the whole field has uh, used a lot of uh, epigenetic markers um, to identify the potential um, enhanced regions in our genome. And the result was quite successful. So if you look at the ENCODE data, they have used a panel of markers, such as the histone uh, markers, the DNS hypersensitivity, and the P300 binding to identify almost a million enhancers on different cell types of the human genome. And what's more important is that if you look at the uh, human GWAS result, actually a lot of the GWAS hits are located within the enhancer region or enhancer neighboring regions, uh, which may make us think that uh, uh, really emphasize the importance of the enhancers during the disease and development. Um, um, however, um, for most of the enhancers we have identified, um, we don't have a functional understanding um, of them. So most of their studies are quite descriptive and um, a lot of them are just based on the uh, correlation analysis. So we think it's really important to actually perform the functional uh, study of those enhancers. And uh, one feature of enhancer actually really complicates uh, this problem even more, uh, which is enhancers does not uh, locate right next to its target genes. Instead, it, it is generally believed that enhancers often regulate the genes that are located in the distance, uh, ranging from one KB to about a one megabase. And uh, uh, therefore, if you have, uh, and if the, primary targets gene that are directly regulated by enhancers happen to be some transcriptional factor, then you will see some um, other target genes all throughout the genome, uh, which we we'll call them secondary targets, right? So if you have a, a mutation located on the enhancer, in order to fully understand the mechanism of, of those mutations, you have to be able to identify the primary and the secondary targets of those enhancers. And the perfect example to uh, uh, describe this idea is this enhancer located within the uh, famous gene PCR 11.1a. And uh, uh, in 2017, um, people from Stuart Hawkins lab have identified a few mutations within those uh, re regions. It's actually uh, within the intron of the gene. Uh, they found that th those mutations are highly correlated with uh, some blood disease, such as uh, beta thanosemia. Uh, and uh, in those patients, uh, what is usually seen is that uh, increased level of the fatal hemoglobin proteins. However, um, as you can see here, those mutations, they don't directly regulate the hemo, uh, hemoglobin genes. Instead, they actually regulate the BC, PCR11-1A, which turns out to be the suppressor of those uh, hemoglobin genes. So a few years ago, we, we and other people started to use single cell perturbation assays to study the function of enhancers in their original uh, geno genomic context. So uh, we actually use CRISPR-I uh, to perturb the enhancers in which uh, we have a catalytically a dead Cas9 or DCAS9 fused with the crab domain. So once this whole construct is recruited to a certain enhancer regions, it starts to recruit other uh, suppressors as well as um, uh, deposit some um, histone modifications to the enhancer region and therefore can shut down the enhancer function. So the idea is that we can, we can use a lentivirus uh, library to infect the cell type you want to study so that in every single cell, you have a different guide RNA, which means different enhancers are being shut down. And later on, we apply the sample to the single cell RNA technology. And within the same cell, you can capture both the sgRNA identity and as well as the transcriptome. So which means that you can simultaneously get your perturbation and your um, the phenotypic readout, which is the transcriptome. Um, but the problem with those assays is that if you look at all uh, both ours and other people's older data, the problem is that the assay is usually quite noisy, which means that um, in most of the case, if you want to get confident results, we have to narrow the search space of the genes, uh, which means we can, in most of the case, we can only confidently identify the primary target of the enhancers, not the secondary target. So in this research, we're trying to um, optimize this assay uh, so that we can um, detect both the primary and the secondary targets on genes. So we have done two major um, optimizations for the assay. First one is just experimentally. Uh, so all the old uh, papers we published, we, uh, people use two to three guides per region. 
Uh, so we thought that individual guides might cause some strong knock targets and therefore increase the noise in the final results. So in this case, we use 10 guides per region. So we hope by doing this can really uh, minimize the off target introduced by individual guides. And of course, uh, second optimization is uh, computationally, we have performed the gene specific uh, p-value corrections for our result, which turns out to, to work re really well. So let me give you one example um, to show you what I mean by gene specific p-value correction. So here's one uh, example region that we targeted. Uh, this region is on chromosome five, and here is the enhancer region locates uh, about 16 KB downstream of the, um, the, this gene AR15, and there's another link RNA gene uh, right next to it. So first of all, here I use the Manhattan plot to show you the raw p-values of all the differentially expression tests. And so x-axis indicates the position of the genes ranked by their, uh, uh, ranked based on their uh, position on different chromosomes, and y-axis is just the p-value, and the red dots indicates the genes that are upregulated, and the blue dots indicate the genes that are downregulated. And more importantly, there's a vertical dash line you can see here actually indicates the target region. And as you can see that uh, we got a pretty significant p-values for those two neighboring genes, right? But unfortunately, if you look at the other genes on the chromosome, they, it seems that a lot of genes are also have very significant p-values. So the question is, should we trust this result? Are they real secondary heats or they're just some noise? So uh, uh, we can look at the balkanistic data as a gold standard. So as you can see that actually when we perform the target the same region by CRISPR I and in balkanistic, you only see these two uh, neighboring genes change and nothing gets upregulated, so, which means all the other genes you see in the SCR are just noise. So how we can get rid of those noise? So it turns out that we can use some um, um, background p-values to correct them. So we, prof we um, by randomly choose the cells in the assay, you can perform the background p-value for every individual genes. And uh, for example, there is this uh, non-target gene, you can see uh, even though the p-value, the raw p-value look quite decent, but if you look at the background, the background uh, is also very high uh, versus these this two real heats. Uh, they have a decent p raw p-value, but if you look at the background, the background seems to be very low. So um, actually we can um, correct this by picking a cutoff based on the background p-value and calculate the difference between the cutoff and the raw p-value. It's a pretty simple idea. And uh, if we apply this to the same data set and show you the same Manhattan plot after the adjustment, you can see we pretty much get rid of most of the signal while maintaining the real signal here. So uh, we have developed the assay. We just apply this uh, analysis to about 500 enhancers in kfs 6 2 cells. We, uh, we design 10 guides per region, as I mentioned, and then we sequenced in total about 100,000 cells. Um, so about this whole data set, we took two steps to an analyze the data. First of all, we want to identify the primary target genes of those enhancers. So by primary in this analysis, I focused on the plus minus two megabits region of um, uh, any um, DNA's hypersensitive sites we targeted. And here's another example. This is the famous um, trans transcriptional regulator MEP gene. And we, here we targeted this enhancer clus clusters about 140 kilobits downstream of the gene. And uh, here are uh, four DNA hypersensitive sites we targeted. Uh, if you look at this red track here, and here I'm just going to show you the results from uh, two of them. And as you can see, that uh, here is the same Manhattan plot, but I'm only showing you the plus minus two megabits of the region. And as you can see, MIB is the consistent heat of this, both of these two uh, regions. And uh, HI1, which is the gene right here, is a secondary, uh, it's a less significant um, primary heat. And of course, uh, we can look at the whole transcriptome, and uh, it's the same Manhattan plot as the result from the same uh, two regions. And of course, the, if you, uh, locally, you only see uh, MIP, which are the primary hits, but globally, you see a lot of uh, genes that are uh, both either upregulated or downregulated. And I hope you can appreciate that many of those genes are indeed overlap between those two regions, which means that they are actually signals, not just some random noise we see. So, uh, Next, we thought of, um, have thought of uh, having a way so that we can summarize the whole data set um, of these 500 enhancers. So the idea is that we can construct the network by connecting the enhancers, their primary targets, and their secondary targets. So if we use this diamond shape to represent enhancer, and then we can um, uh, use this uh, circle to present the genes, right? So first of all, we can connect the H between their enhancer and the primary target gene. In this case, it would be MEP. And of course, you can 
further connect uh, the primary node to the secondary heats, uh, either um, activating or um, inhibiting. So that's what we got. Uh, actually, in total, we, uh, we combine all the data together. We actually got 20 networks. But uh, interestingly, many of those genes uh, actually uh, form this one huge network. This is the largest network we have got. And uh, I want to point out a few things in this network. And uh, here's just one simple example, as I mentioned previously. Here you got, uh, for this MIP gene, you got four uh, enhancers we perturbed. And so those are directly connected to the primary heats, which is the MIB. And of course, um, here you can um, identify the secondary target genes of the MIB. So first thing we notice in this network is that this, um, this network is actually centralized um, around four major uh, transcriptional factors and their enhancers. Uh, for example, I just showed you the case of MIB. You can see a lot of genes are regulated by MIB, as well as this gene CBFA2T3, or also known as ETO2. And also other two factors, LMO2 and NFE2, are also known to have very important functions in the uh, blood cell lineages. And what's most interesting is that if you look at those, those genes uh, in the middle of the network, uh, which are highlighted by a, deep, a darker color, uh, the color actually indicates the age number of that node. Okay? So you can see the, this middle part are highlighted, those genes are actually regulated by multiple genes and their enhancers. And uh, I have to clarify that when we were selecting those enhancers, we did not use any priori knowledge about their functions. But interestingly, you can see even though all those um, enhancers were locating from totally different genomic loci, but they turned to uh, converge to this same set of genes, which actually uh, suggesting a very interesting transcriptional regulation network within the cell type. And uh, of course, in the last, I want to show you one example about um, how we can use this information to help us understanding the um, function of the SNPs. So uh, for example, this MIB enhancer we studied in this, uh, um, uh, in this, uh, in this exam, uh, experiment, we can see um, around this enhancer region, if you look at the GWAS data set, there are actually a lot of the GWAS heats which are identified, uh, which are believed to be uh, blood associated. However, if you look at the uh, INCO data set, those uh, SNPs uh, are usually assigned to this gene here, AHI1, because of the proximity. But I think in our study, we clearly show that this enhancer region is directly regulating MIP, uh, which, uh, which means that those SNPs, uh, the mechanism of those SNPs could also be uh, um, working through the regulation of the MIP gene. So uh, in conclusion, in this study, I have showed you that we use, we have optimized our single cell perturbation assays. Uh, we have showed that we can confidently identify both the primary and the secondary targets uh, genes of the enhancers. And I have showed that um, uh, by our 500 enhancer data set, we can construct the regulatory network in the KFSS2 cells. And interestingly, a lot of, um, we found that those enhancers, even though they locate on different uh, genomic loci, but they turn to converge to regulate the same set of genes. And then in the last case, I showed you there's a potential uh, application of this assay, which is you can use, to, to use this to understand the mechanisms of uh, disease-associated genetic mutations. So with that, I want to acknowledge all the people um, um, have, done, have made contribution to this work. Uh, so my PI, Gary Hong, is always a good mentor. And the other people have done a lot of work, including Daniel and Pei and Jale. And I also want to thank my funding agencies. And I'm, I'm going to stop here to take any questions you have. Thank you.